Great. Um, can you hear and see all right, Sophie and Abira? Does that look yeah. all right? Yeah. Great. So thank you for the welcome and um, thank you for coming along uh, this evening. Um, I intend to keep this um, as, as interactive as possible. Um, I'm going to be uh, using Slido at various points. So um, either uh, through a web link or through a QR code uh, using your smartphone. Um, I would like to invite people to participate and um, contribute. Uh, and uh, I'll also go, got the Zoom chat open here. So if you've got any comments or questions as we go along, um, uh, that's fine. Um, I think I may have probably too much material because we need to be finished by about eight o'clock so you can get on with the rest of your evenings. So I think it's possible we won't get to the nausea and vomiting bit, but we'll see just how um, time goes, if that's okay. Um, so just a few words of introduction, um, and then I'll talk about um, prescribing for pain and syringe pumps. Um, a few updates on completing death certificates. Um, hopefully we'll get through to nausea and vomiting and um, communication skills. So William Osler, uh, regarded really as the, um, the grandfather of UK medicine, um, wrote this, and I think he's absolutely on the money, that the good physician treats the disease, and the great physician treats the person, <clears throat> excuse me, who has the disease. So the good oncologist is very, very good at treating cancer. The great oncologist also treats the person who has the cancer. And I think that is worth thinking about. Um, and then particularly apropos this evening, uh, death is part of life and is absolutely not a failure. Uh, and so what you will seek to do um, in your careers as an oncologist, or if you end up in another specialty, is sometimes to cure, and that'll be great, often to relieve and to palliate, and always please to comfort. And uh, let's just get um, in then to some of the substance here. And again, some sort of basic things to comment on, and then we'll start doing some um, drug calculations. There is definitely more to analgesia than analgesics. And particularly in palliative care, but it's true in the whole of medicine, to be honest, uh, uh, we're talking about total patient care. And we're going to focus on the physical and the psychological and the social and the existential. And I would argue that when someone is approaching the end of their life, all of these four domains come into play in a big way. Yes, they have physical symptoms, but when they know that time is short, that is clearly psychologically very difficult. They've got goodbyes to say, so it's socially very different. And I put to you whether or not people have particular religious beliefs, all of us by being human will have questions of meaning and purpose and fairness. And what's my life been about as they look back over their lives? And, and that's what I would call existential. Um, and often we see all four of these interplaying and, and Quite often, we see a condition known in the palliative care world as total pain, where there is physical symptoms plus psychological distress, plus social and existential distress. And the patient tells you they've got terrible, terrible pain, doctor, and you find that the analgesics don't work because this is primarily not a physical um, problem. This is psychological, social, or existential, and all those domains obviously um, overlap. Happy to expand on that, but let's just move on. I'm sure you're familiar with the good old WHO analgesic ladder, where uh, step one, step two, step three, 
uh, we start with non-opioids such as paracetamol with or without an adjuvant such as um, a non-steroidal. We then go up to step two, uh, which is an opioid for mild to moderate pain by which one's talking about codeine, dihydrocodeine and tramadol. And then we come up to the strong um, or the opioids for moderate to severe pain, what used to be called strong opioids, um, such as morphine. And the important thing is if you're not controlling the pain on a step one analgesic, please go up to step two. And if you're not controlling the pain on a step two analgesic and you think it's opioid responsive, um, and the three common non-opioid responsive pains would be raised into cranial pressure, um, bone pain, and uh, uh, neuropathic pain, uh, and obviously total pain as well. Um, but those often require different approaches. But a number of trials have demonstrated that in advanced cancer, 85% of patients will get satisfactory analgesia simply by following the WHO analgesic ladder. So let's start then um, by doing some polls. So either go to slido.com uh, and go for hash 160772, you can see on the screen there, or use your camera and go for the QR code. And hopefully, once we've got started, people will be able to um, vote and Ah, good, it's working. That's brilliant. Please keep going. So this is a question of which of these are step three on the WHO analgesic ladder. And I think I set the poll up right and that you will be able to answer more than once because more than one of these are on step three of the WHO analgesic ladder. Okay, how are we doing? Pretty well. Uh, so the answer is morphine, fentanyl, and oxycodone. And notable that no one has actually voted for oxycodone. Uh, so those are all step three opioids um, for strong uh, moderate to severe pain, um, what I tend to call strong opioids. Okay, that's great. So keep going with your smartphone then. Um, so you, the poll should have come up now. If you give someone a dose of oral morphine, uh, oromorph as known as, um, how quickly will they start getting analgesia? Um, and just to reassure you, all these polls, by the way, are anonymous. Um, so please do go ahead. And Sophie has just told me on a message that apparently you can only select one, which is a pain. Certainly for the previous slide, sorry, I set it up wrong. But for this one, you can, there's really only, yes, there's just one to select here. So how quickly does oral morphine work? And what we're going for here is most of us are saying 20 minutes, and some saying 10, 30, 45 minutes. Um, so approximately 20 minutes um, is 20 to 30 is, is the kind of rule of thumb because morphine is absorbed directly through the gastric mucosa. Uh, so there's a bit of a tip there. Uh, I've talked about pains being opioid responsive. And there's two things I would say. So the firstly, if your patient is still having pain, um, then I would ask them two questions. Firstly, um, when they, the nurses give you the oral morphine, um, does it help? And if the patient says, frankly, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference, then that is suggesting this is an opioid non-responsive pain. Similarly, if the patient says, oh, doctor, you know, it's wonderful, it works within a three to five minutes, that is a pharmacological impossibility. And that's a strong pointer to a major psychological element because morphine cannot afford pain relief within five minutes. It takes at least 20 
to 30 minutes. So this is more free text. Um, would you like to suggest when you might like to use oxycodone rather than morphine? So oxycodone is a strong opioid uh, and we do sometimes use it in place of or instead of morphine. Um, and lots of people are saying um, renal impairment and CKD, that's completely right. Um, and low EGFR, all much the same answer, thank you. So the problem with morphine and diamorphine and codeine and dihydrocodeine is that essentially they are all converted into morphine 6-glucuronide, which is renally excreted. So that's the active metabolite. Um, so with significant renal impairment, and there's no absolute cutoff, um, but certainly if you've got an EGFR of less than 30, uh, then you are in great danger of getting accumulation of the active metabolites and morphine toxicity, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. And uh, the beauty of oxycodone is that something between 80 and 90% of the active metabolites are inactivated in the liver. There is about 10 to 20% of the active metabolites that are renally excreted. So it's not 100% okay. Um, but someone has helpfully suggested hallucinations with morphine. So I'm gonna come back to that. But one of the reasons um, hallucinations suggests opioid toxicity, but certainly if a patient is feeling really doped up, drugged up, unable to think clearly. Um, so it's often the side effects uh, of particular drowsiness uh, that is the reason that you might like to do an opioid switch to um, a, a synthetic opioid such as oxycodone. Um, I guess I've answered this question, uh, which of the following should be used with caution? So I uh, do vote if you want to, but essentially morphine, yes, oxycodone, no, diamorphine, yes, codeine, yes, oxycodone, no, Tramadol, yes. Um, so um, the only one that is um, is really um, uh, okay to use. Sorry, it's a bit of a strange way I've answered the question. Um, so all of those, apart from oxycodone, should be used with considerable caution um, in renal failure. Now. The other opioid that we sometimes use, strong opioid we sometimes use is fentanyl, uh, transdermal. Uh, two tips about fentanyl before we come on to this question. So you will be aware that when a fentanyl patch is put on a patient, it takes approximately 18 hours, one eight hours to get a good plasma level. And the fentanyl patch is then changed every three days. So, if your patient is in acute pain now, a fentanyl patch is not helpful. And if a patient has pain that is unstable and you're requiring to titrate the dose on a daily or even more frequent basis, then you don't have that flexibility uh, with, uh, with a fentanyl patch. So um, we're a bit cautious in the palliative care world about using fentanyl. The other thing to say is if your patient is already on a fentanyl patch and uh, you need additional top-up opiates, please do not take the fentanyl patch off and try to do a clever conversion. Um, we're gonna talk about um, opioid conversions in just a moment. Leave the fentanyl patch on and give them PRN um, alternative opioid. If they don't have um, CKD, then that could be uh, morphine. And if they do have CKD, that would be oxycodone. Yes, pharmacologically inelegant, you're giving two strong opioids, but the number of times I have seen colleagues get the maths wrong is really quite significant. So even in specialist palliative medicine practice, keep the fentanyl patch going, keep changing it every three hours, top them up um, with an additional strong opioid. And this is interesting. So the conversion, when you put a fentanyl patch on a patient, how much opioid are you giving them? And um, many of these opioid conversions are um, uh, estimates, 
Um, the answer is between 60 and 90 milligrams. It's certainly not 30 milligrams. So just be conscious, please, that when you pop a, pop a fentanyl patch on a patient, you're giving them quite a lot of opioid. And if the next day um, you then feel that the pain isn't well controlled and you put another one on, then are you really looking for the patient to have between 120 and 180 milligrams uh, of morphine per 24 hours? A lot of people are taken aback by the potency um, of fentanyl patches. Now, let's think about opioid toxicity versus opioid side effects. And I would suggest to you that um, some of these are uh, opioid side effects, not indicating that you are potentially um, giving excessive doses of opioids. But some of these, if you see them, particularly if you see more than one of them, that means your patient is opioid toxic. And if your patient is opioid toxic, even if they are still in pain, you must, repeat, must reduce the dose of the opiate and think of using co-analgesics such as non-steroidals, uh, neuropathic agents, radiotherapy, or other sorts of um, approaches. So um, the three that we have down the bottom of the figure of nausea and vomiting, constipation, and a degree of mental clouding, I would, and, and are now well recognized as being common side effects, but not indications of opioid toxicity. So 100% of patients will get constipation, therefore 100% should be on a laxative. About a third will get significant nausea and vomiting, and therefore should have a PRN antiemetic, and the antiemetic of choice is haloperidol, because it works on the central chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is the primary way that morphine makes people constipated. And for the first uh, nauseated, and for the first two or three days, people will often experience mental clouding, which then clears. But if they go on to hallucinations, that's a sign of opioid toxicity. Uh, certainly, um, myoclonic jerks, pinpoint pupils, and then when you're getting into serious opioid toxicity, you're looking at respiratory depression. If you've got a patient who is on reasonably long-term or needing strong opiates for analgesia and you're running into respiratory depression, then what you really want to try to avoid, if you possibly can, is giving them the full reversal dose of naloxone. Now, if a substance abuser comes in with a heroin overdose, it is life-saving to give them the full IV dose of um, naloxone. The problem if you do that in the palliative care situation is you block all the opiate receptors and your patient will have uncontrollable pain. The only analgesia that you'll be able to give them will be paracetamol or non-steroidal. Any sort of opiate you have completely blocked. So if you think you've got significant respiratory depression that is becoming clinically worrying, uh, then clearly, you know, wind back the dose of the opiates. Get your palliative care team colleagues to see them because we will do a, a naloxone infusion um, or give smaller aliquots, um, titrating against the respiratory rate and the oxygen sats to avoid um, we certainly want to avoid complete reversal um, for the reasons that I've outlined there. But those top four, respiratory depression, hallucinations, pinpoint pupils and myoclonus, red flags for opioid toxicity. And um, I'm happy to share these slides afterwards, by the way, if that's um, helpful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, opioid conversions. I do not think you need to memorize these. I'm going to give you a web link in a couple of slides time to an online resource which does all the maths for you. But essentially, um, if you're using codeine, dihydrocodeine, things like that, um, it's about a 1 to 10 
So um, 10 milligrams of codeine is about one milligram of oral morphine. And we tend to use oral morphine as a sort of key um, calibration here. And if you're going down the oxycodone route, um, then as you can see, it's, it's an inexact science here. Um, something like two to one, so half the dose if you're going to oral oxycodone, and something like half the dose if you're going to subcutaneous oxycodone. So if you had 40 milligrams of oral morphine, that would be 20 milligrams of oral oxycodone, which would be 10 milligrams of subcut oxycodone. Um, in years gone by, we used to use quite a lot of diamorphine subcutaneously, either as a stat dose or in a syringe pump. Uh, there's been national shortages of diamorphine, and in most areas now, uh, we use subcutaneous morphine, um, which is a two to one conversion. So 40 milligrams of oral morphine, 20 milligrams of subcut morphine. Um, alfentanil is a potent drug. Um, my suggestion to you is unless you are very confident in the use of alfentanil, um, certainly. Um, until you're a very experienced colleague. Um, you may want to use alfentanil, but get the palliative care team or your hospital pharmacy team or your ward pharmacist to help you with um, the drug calculations. Um, alfentanil is not great as a stat dose subcutaneously because it has an extremely short half-life, um, but can be used in a syringe pump subcutaneously. Uh, we can't give fentanyl subcutaneously, it's too irritating in a syringe pump. Um, and we don't give it stat for that reason. So you will see these sort of conversions here, um, which I suggest uh, you don't memorize. Um, we'll forward the slides to you. This is the most wonderful online resource, um, freely available. Um, it's particularly helpful for use of syringe drivers. Um, it's got loads and loads of palliative care guidelines, opioid dose conversions. I'm just gonna go on to the next slide. So down the left here, you can see it's got a sort of online textbook. Um, uh, but here, this is the page when you're trying to convert opioids. So what's the regular opioid? What are the stat doses? What's the transdermal patch of what? Put that all in there. You want to convert it to maybe a subcutaneous infusion. Um, and you want to use morphine over 24 hours. And uh, you press go, and it does the calculation for you. It's a terrific resource. Um, and then if you go down to the next one, uh, in terms of syringe driver compatibility, you simply plug in, I'd like to give this patient morphine plus haloperidol plus midazolam plus gycopronium. Can they all mix? Press go and it'll tell you, yes, you can. But if you want to put um, some other drugs in there, um, cyclozine can be difficult. Uh, and many of the other more rare drugs that we use uh, certainly dexamethasone needs its own syringe pump, for example, but it will tell you that. Terrific resource, um, really commend that one um, to you. So I'm just going to pause for a moment and um, see if people have got any questions or if I've um, got explained things. Please do pop some things in Sligo and I'm happy to answer or put them in the, in the Zoom chat. Okay, thank you. Slido's working. Don't seem to be any questions. We're gonna pause for other questions um, as we go on. So um, let's put this all into practice. Oh, sorry, was there something else there? Um, what's the best laxative for opioid-induced constipation? Um, a good question. Um, you need a fecal softener and a, um, a stimulant. Um, so something will stimulate peristalsis, provided obviously you've not got bowel obstruction, in which case you need to be much more careful. Um, so um, there is no good evidence that any one uh, laxative um, is particularly better than any other. Um, so we do use Macrogol, uh, you know, that suspension uh, laxido, um, and that is um, essentially um, osmotic, and that for many people is adequate. Um, sometimes you might need to add uh, something like some senna on top of that um, as a gentle 
stimulant uh, of, of peristalsis. Um, but often macrogol, those sort of standard laxatives, um, or sometimes sodium docosate um, on its own, 100 to 200 milligrams a day would be fine. Um, there's no good evidence base that one's better than any other, I'm afraid. So let's have a go. You're looking after a 74-year-old man who's got carcinoma pancreas. And he's got severe upper abdominal pain that is responding well to morphine. So hint number one, this is an opioid responsive pain. And he's now vomiting. So you're going to have to abandon the oral route. So we're just thinking about pain at the moment. Um, and what he's taking at the moment is 30 milligrams twice a day of sustained release morphine. And on average, he's had four lots of 10 milligrams um, of morphine. Is that certainly what he's had in the last 24 hours? So 60 milligrams of sustained release plus 40 milligrams of um, uh, oromorph, uh, more immediate release. But because he's vomiting, there's no point continuing with the oral route. And we'll think about antiemetics potentially a bit later on. So 30 BD of MST, sustained release morphine, plus four lots of 10 milligrams. And you're going to put a syringe driver up. And how much morphine would you like to put in the syringe driver? And you're completely right. Um, it is 50 milligrams. So this patient is taking uh, 30 BD, which is 60, and these needed 40 milligrams on top, which would take you up to 100 milligrams of oral morphine. If you feel that is um, something you want to do a direct dose conversion, then you divide it by two and you go for 50 milligrams. Um, if you felt that analgesia was still inadequate and you wanted to increase the dose still further, you might want to go to 60 milligrams. But in terms of direct conversion, it's pretty straightforward. It's two to one. But as you reach for your prescribing pen or if it's, if it's paper or online prescribing, this is morphine and you're looking at 50 milligrams of morphine. It is entirely appropriate for you just to sense check with someone have I got the dose right? Because um, you don't want to get this one wrong. Now, this is a man with carcinoma of pancreas who is vomiting. What antiemetic do you think might be an appropriate one to put in his syringe driver? And this is a slightly early question, but let's think about that, because if time allows, um, I'll, I'll go over the, the mechanisms of, of, of nausea and vomiting. Um, because the antiemetic you choose depends on the reason for the nausea or vomiting. And it's a bit like saying, well, what's the best painkiller? Well, it depends on what is causing the pain. If it's neuropathic, you need a neuropathic agent. If it's um, soft tissue invasion, nociceptive pain, it'll be an opioid. Um, if it's bony metastasis, it'll be a non-steroidal. Now, why do, you, why do we potentially think this man is vomiting? There can be multifactorial, multifactorial reasons. Um, this, when you take a history of this man's um, nausea, actually, um, it was much more a gastric outlet obstruction problem. The carcinoma of pancreas partially, but not completely obstructing the, um, the, the duodenum. Uh, and that sort of uh, gastric outlet obstruction the number one drug of choice, um, our people are starting to vote for metoclopramide. Thank you, you've got the hint. Absolutely, one will be thinking of metoclopramide being the drug of choice because you want a prokinetic antiemetic that will stimulate peristalsis and get the stomach um, emptied. 
And the sort of nausea and vomiting you get in this situation is relatively little nausea, but large, big vomits. And the patient empties their stomach, brings up maybe half a litre or a litre and feels hugely better. Whereas the nausea and vomiting associated, for example, with opiates or with hypercalcemia or with uremia is the primary cause there is irritation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And these patients are perpetually nauseated and vomit very little. In gastric outlet obstruction, they're not very nauseated, but can vomit spectacular amounts. And if you had a patient with hypercalcemia or opioid-induced vomiting, then they'd be nauseated um, all the time, not particularly vomiting large amounts. Um, and that sort of history would point me towards, in that situation, something like haloperidol working on the chemoreceptor trigger zone. But let's move on, because this man now deteriorates and is recognized to be dying and he becomes restless and agitated and starts developing rattly breathing. So he's getting very close to the end of his life. You've got an opioid such as morphine in the driver. You've got metoclopramide in the syringe driver. Are there other things that you would like to add to his syringe driver? So would you like to vote? Good, keep going. So levomepromazine, we tend to keep as a second line antiemetic because it's intensely sedating. It works on almost um, all the receptors involved, but it is very, very sedating. So in low dose, it can be a useful sort of second line um, antiemetic. It can be used uh, for uh, sedation, particularly if there's a, um, a delirium or a psychotic component. So I had a patient just the other day who had um, a steroid secreting tumor and had a steroid related um, delirium was seeing pink elephants um, and levomepromazine or a drug of that nature being a phenothiazine would be particularly helpful. Uh, but in this case, if this patient is not um, psychotic, and they need some agitation because they're coming very distressed towards the end, then good old midazolam would be the drug of choice. Absolutely, dose will depend. Um, and then you want an anticholinergic. Um, we tend to use a drug like glycoperonium um, or hyacin hydrobromide or actually butyl bromide. Both of them will be effective as anticholinergics, reducing the secretions. But please be aware that the um, hyacin and glycoperonium will not um, dry up secretions that have already formed. They will help to prevent the development of further secretions. So please be on the front foot, put some glycoperonium in the driver sooner rather than later, but also be aware it will inevitably give the patient a really rather dry, a very dry mouth. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment and see if there's any questions. Good. Sounds like we're doing okay. Um, and actually, I think I might skip over these slides. I'm just going to go to these two here, which I think are important. Does the use of dimorphine or morphine at the end of life hasten death? Uh, and this is a study from St. Christopher's Hospice in London, published in no lesser journal than The Lancet a few years ago now, but this was consecutive deaths at the hospice. Um, look at the modest median doses of subcutaneous morphine this patient's needed. Um, 26 milligrams, so the equivalent of 50 milligrams of oral morphine is perfectly adequate for the majority of people. And there were some patients who needed an increase in opioid dose because their pain uh, was becoming more severe. And there were others for whom the analgesic was steady. And so the dose was not increased. 
And this is not a randomized controlled trial. It would be unethical to do a randomized controlled trial. But if the dose was increased because the patient needed it, they did not show shorter survival, more episodes of sudden deterioration and death, or deaths described as more peaceful. So when you are talking to patients or talking to their family members about saying, we're increasing the dose of the morphine, in the syringe drivers so that we can keep on top of their pain, so we can keep on the front foot in front of the curve, all those sorts of phrases. Please reassure people that this will in no way hasten the end. Now, if you go, we usually suggest 33 to 50 milligrams, so 10 milligrams to 15 to 20 to 30, uh, until you get good analgesia, you will not hasten the end. If you go from 10 milligrams in 24 hours to 150 milligrams in 24 hours, clearly different story. And the evidence from these same authors is the same in terms of sedation. Again, consecutive patients, and some patients needed the sedation, some didn't. So please don't routinely give people sedation at the end of life. Um, some people want to be awake as long as possible. Um, and some people it's appropriate to sedate. But again, an appropriate amount of sedation, um, not a milligram more than they needed of midazolam, but nor a milligram less than they needed. There was no evidence that you will shorten survival. Um, in this case, there were two patients who had a very, very extreme um, distress and agitation. And we had one of these in the hospice recently, a patient who was dying these are mercifully extremely rare, and this was two out of 237 deaths. Um, and in these cases, and it's usually due to very major unresolved psychological issues, that the patient gets fantastically distressed at the end of life. And in these cases, they, these patients were given large doses of midazolam plus large doses of levomipromazine, and in some cases also, um, doses of phenobarbitone as well. And you need to be clear, please, on the ethics of doing that. Check it out with your colleagues. You are giving sedation in order to relieve distress. Your intention is not to hasten the end of life. If your intention is to hasten the end of life, then that's an, it's unethical and indeed illegal practice. But not to give adequate sedation to a patient who is dying with extreme distress is an unethical thing to do as well. But please be very clear what you're doing and why you're doing it. Now, those are very rare and very unusual. So please, um, major doses of sedation, very rare. But here we go, Lancet Oncology, a literature review gained from these same authors, um, that says patients are more likely to receive higher doses of both opioids and sedatives. There is no evidence that initiation or treatment or increases in doses of opioids or sedatives is associated with the precipitation of death. If you increase as much as the patient needs, you will not accelerate things at all. And so please, you don't even need to start thinking about or talking about double effect. Do you remember double effect where you have an intended consequence and a foreseen but unintended consequence? Double effect would be relevant for those two complicated patients. But in normal practice, that you don't need to talk to the relatives about double effect because there is no double effect, because there is no unforeseen consequence. And indeed, a fear about double effect can lead people to underdose and leave a person um, dying with suboptimally controlled pain or suboptimally controlled uh, distress. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions about that uh, if people would like to, uh, or maybe we can just go on. Um, there's a lot of misperceptions out there about opioids, um, about addiction and tolerance and hastening the end. And we can talk about some of those. I've talked about hastening the end there. Um, so I'm gonna move on um, a little bit, um, just to cover really briefly, um, filling in um, death certificates. 
So if your patient has an expected death from natural causes, then it is distinctly likely that you'll be able to fill in the medical certificate of cause of death. If your patient has an unexpected death, or it is from unnatural causes, or you don't know the cause, then you can't fill in the certificate. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that requires discussion with the coroner and may require a post-mortem would be, for example, a cancer patient who is on a therapeutic trial. Now, it may be quite clear to you that the drug was not responsible for the patient's death, but there at least needs to be a discussion with the coroner um, who may then decide that there's a need for a post-mortem possibly. Um, now, since I wrote this slide, um, practice is changing in the UK and medical examiners are coming in. They are there in most acute trusts across the country. They are about to start to be introduced in the community. Um, there is variable practice because we're at a time of transition. So when your patient has died and death has been verified, at this point now, in most trusts, you need, as the foundation you're a doctor or whatever stage you're working at, you need to have a conversation with the medical examiner, a member of their team, talk through with them what was, um, what was the, the, the illnesses the patient had, what, was, um, the, what happened as they died. Um, they will um, talk through with you. They will guide you on what to put in the medical certificate of the cause of death. Um, they will say to you whether or not this needs to be referred on to the coroner, and they will also speak to the family and to ask the family whether they had any concerns as to their loved one's um, death. Um, and then obviously, um, if things can go ahead, you issue the MCCD, the next of kin register it, uh, then the registrar issues officially the death certificate. We don't do that, we do the MCCD. Um, and then it can be burial or possibly going on uh, for cremation um, if they want. And so we have to fill this in to the best of our knowledge. Um, if we lie, that is a legal and professional um, major blunder. Please do not write a discharge summary on an MCCD. Um, it is very tempting to put lots and lots of things on. You are only saying what the cause of death was. And what you put under one was the cause of death. What you put under two was what contributed to but did not cause the death. Uh, and um, you should be able to complete an MCCD without putting anything under two. Because uh, if it's under two, but you feel it must be there, then it probably was something that caused. Um, and then here you go, I got a person who comes in with the bronchopneumonia. And the reason they had a bronchopneumonia is they had carcinoma bronchus. So 1A is due to 1B is due to 1C. And in this case, 1C is blank. And um, you could write here carcinoma bronchus. This is a clinical judgment, but it would probably not be right to say bronchopneumonia and not mention the carcinoma bronchus because it's a clinical judgment but probably this person developed a bronchopneumonia because they had abnormal anatomy of the carcinoma bronchus. And if they hadn't had the carcinoma bronchus, they might never have got the bronchopneumonia or indeed they may have um, uh, recovered from the bronchopneumonia. So I hope that's making sense. I'm sure you've seen um, the MCCD. Um, this is what it looks like. Probably in years to come, it's going to go um, electronic. Um, you put your qualifications here, you put your GMC registration number, and you put the name of the consultant um, who is responsible for the person's care. Really briefly, there are a number of things that require referral to the coroner. Uh, so a bone fracture within 12 months of death, um, clearly something like suicide or homicide. You don't even begin to fill in the certificates unless you're a consultant pathologist. This is automatic referral. Even if it's suspected suicide or suspected homicide, over to the coroner, they'll look into it. Um, 
Industrial diseases need to be referred to the coroner, um, as do transport accidents, and drugs and poisons, whether a deliberate overdose or an accidental overdose. Um, there are some bits of paperwork that need to be done that don't involve you and I if the body is going to be taken out of England. Don't worry about that. Um, a sudden infant death, um, which is unexpected with no preceding illness, must be referred to the coroner. Anyone who is in police custody or detained under the Mental Health Act, even if it's a community order, must be discussed with the coroner. Um, this one is variable. So death within 24 hours of admission to hospital, um, it would depend on the area that you work in. The default is yes, um, that someone comes in and even if it's blindingly obvious, they've had an anterior infarct, have an arrest and die. Um, but in some areas um, that I've worked in, the coroner said, if you are quite clear what they've died from, I don't want a conversation. Other coroners do want a conversation. So if someone has a, an accident that leads to their death, um, or has an operation and they die shortly after an operational procedure. These all need to be referred to the coroner, even if the operation was fine. So an elderly person falls at home, breaks their neck of femur, has a dynamic hip screw and dies um, post-operatively, maybe you know, week, 10 days afterwards. There were three reasons for compulsory referral there. There's been a bone fracture, there's been a domestic accident, and there's been surgery. Um, acute alcohol poisoning, not chronic alcohol poisoning, um, and obviously sudden unexpected deaths, or if you don't know the cause of death, um, I'm going to come back to the 14 days in just um, a minute. I'm galloping through this. I hope this is helpful. And so when there's been a discussion with the coroner's officer, um, essentially they will discuss with the coroner, and the decision will be a kind of binary one, which is, yes, that's fine, go ahead, issue the MCCD, and then you have to circle number four and initial box A on the death certificate, or they will say, I'm taking this one, this one off your hands, doctor. Um, this is for one for us to look into. And they will um, do all the necessary paperwork and you do not issue an MCCD. This has changed a bit during the pandemic. And actually in the last week, this slide has become out of death, out of date. Um, so this ch was changes summarized during the pandemic. So if you don't know the cause of death, then you need to refer the patient to the coroner. That's, that's not change. If you do know the cause of death and the patient was seen by any doctor within 28 days before death, then you can go ahead and issue the MCCD. One of the things that's changed just recently is the doctor who saw the patient within the last 28 days before they died must be the doctor who completes the MCCD. During the pandemic, it could be any doctor who did the MCCD. So if they were not seen by a doctor within, 24, within 28 days of death, then um, this rule has changed now. Um, so if no doctor saw them within 28 days, this bit has gone. And if they weren't seen with a doctor within 28 days of death, even if you know what the cause of death was, then there needs to be a discussion with the coroner. And if it's for established disease of an elderly person with dementia who's been in a care home who happened not to have been seen for five or six weeks, then the coroner will almost certainly say, that's fine, go ahead and issue. So forgive me, this slide is now slightly out of date, um, for reasons that have um, changed um, recently. And I'm going to skip on. Um, let's have a go at this one then. So let's have a go at practicing completing an MCCD. So here's an 85 year old man who has bronchopneumonia, prostate cancer, and multiple bony mets. Uh, he comes into your um, ward, you're looking after him, and you give him all the appropriate IV antibiotics, etc. But he deteriorates and dies three days, excuse me, three days later. First question is, can you issue an MCCD? So there's nothing on there that indicates that you can't. So what do you think you might write? 
So 85 year old man, bronchopneumonia, prostate cancer, multiple bony meds. Do people want to just to put one A, one B, one C and two, just type in one or two people and we'll see what we come up with. Great, we've got some suggestions here. Okay, so we're all putting the prostate cancer under two, and this will be a clinical judgment. Um, so that would imply that even if they hadn't had the metastatic prostate cancer, you think they probably would have died, still died of the bronchopneumonia, which is probably quite reasonable. If you thought that the metastatic prostate cancer was contributing, perhaps particularly if there were pulmonary, pulmonary metastases from the prostate cancer, you might want to put that under 1B. But I would agree with that. Um, I would probably want to put the prostate cancer under 2. Uh, but this will go down in, with the Office of National Statistics, not as a cancer death, this will go down as a bronchopneumonia death because the lowest thing on 1A, B or C is what goes down as the underlying cause of death in national statistics. And that's fine. Um, it's, I'm afraid, not a precise science. And there's an interesting um, literature um, around that. And I think we're running out of time to talk about um, nausea and vomiting, I can come back to that um, if you want, but I'm just going to conclude and then maybe we can have a few questions. So I love this poem by W.H. Auden. So give me a Dr. Partridge plump, short in the leg, broad in the rump, an endomorph with gentle hands, who will never make absurd demands that I abandon all my vices or pull a long face in a crisis, but with a gentle twinkle in his eye, will tell me that I have to die, will have the courage to say to their patients that this is where we're at. And what we want to avoid is the doctor underweight, computerized and up-to-date, a business person who understands accountancy and target bands, who demonstrates sincere devotion to audit and to health promotion. But when my outlooks for the worse, passes the buck and refers me to the practice nurse. And a colleague of mine, um, who's the medical director of St. Luke's Hospice in North London, um, just some sort of top communication tips. How do you open up this sort of conversation? And he talks about, about the four W's plus one. And I'm happy to send you the paper on this if helpful. So he says there are four things that begin with W that might help to open up the conversation. One is, I wish I didn't need to have this conversation. I am worried, dot, dot, dot. I wonder if it might be helpful to focus on these concerns and how to plan your care. And what would matter to you if these concerns were to materialize. So the warning shot, I'm afraid the scans are not so good. The third line chemotherapy doesn't appear to be effective. But I wonder if you can, if it would be helpful then to talk about what's important once we're on the same page. And if my fears were to materialize, what would be important to you? And one, so the plus one is important when you've had this rather difficult conversation. And there's one thing I can do. I can get your pain under better control or whatever. And I'm just going to conclude, conclude with this slide. So some of you may have um, seen me use it before. This is a picture of the week from the BMJ um, a few years ago when someone, it was actually a junior healthcare assistant, asked a dying patient at Wigan Royal Albert Infirmary, asked this elderly lady who knew she was dying and was talking very openly about she was dying to say, well, can you tell me what's important to you, um, Stella? Uh, 
Sheila rather was the patient's name. And they were expecting or pain control, or I'd like to have something to eat or drink, or I'd like to be able to get home. And what she said was, I would like to see Bronwyn. And they thought, blimey, who's Bronwyn? I was it your dog? And the answer was no, she'd looked after a horse for 25 years and her dying wish was to say goodbye to her horse. And so they arranged just that. Here she is in the car park of the hospital and they brought her beloved horse in to say goodbye. Now, if someone hadn't asked those four W's, they would never have known because Sheila died 36 hours later and she would never have had her dying wish. So given that we are where we are, can you tell me what's important to you? That would be the question to ask. And maybe it's a meeting with Bronwyn. In other situations, I've had a patient say to me, I want to marry my fiance and I want to marry them today. And you can get an emergency wedding done and we've had the registrar come into the hospice and arrange it, um, and the patient died the next day. I'm gonna stop at that point, and I'm gonna stop 